morning, Harvest Church. My name is Eric. For those who don't know me, I'm the worship pastor here at the church. We're so grateful that you have uh, chosen to join us this morning to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, as you're tuning in right now, just let us know that you're here. Let us know maybe where you're tuning in from. And hey, why don't you like this post? Why don't you share it and allow the Lord to use this uh, with your community and your greater community uh, on social media? That would be fantastic. We, we just expect that the Lord has great plans for that as you, as you go ahead and do that. Even right now, go for it, church. A couple quick things before we get into worship. First of all, uh, we say this every week, but we want you to download our, our Church Center app. This is an app that is downloadable on iOS devices and Android devices, if you have to have an Android. Ooh. Uh, anyways, go ahead and download that app. This is an important and integral app to all things that happen here at the church. You can stay up to date with events that are happening. Uh, you can register for online thing, or sorry, you can register for events when we uh, do open up the building again for that shortly. Uh, and also, you can fill out prayer requests uh, weekly at any point of the week, which is a fantastic opp opportunity. Um, you can also continue to give online. And, and we just want to say thank you to those who have continued to give generously during this season to the Lord's work here. Uh, we are just so grateful uh, to the Lord for you. And we we uh, yeah, just, we're, yeah, we're excited about it. We're, we count it a joy to get to serve the Lord alongside you. Um, we have a discipleship uh, equipping study class that's starting on Monday, February 1st. It's going to be a Zoom online thing uh, hosted by Adam Cormier, one of our elders, as well as Steve Ragg. We're really excited about that. It's a, a general discipleship training course, uh, really taking you in the depths of what it means to be a true disciple of Christ. So we want you to go ahead and register for that on our events page on our website. That would be fantastic. And also, uh, we wanted to let you know that um, as we continue to navigate things with COVID restrictions and stuff, we are looking at how we can open up our building within the restrictions of 10 people um, for various ministries such as youth and other stuff like that. So keep up to date with what we're doing on our website and social media. Uh, our website is myharvestchurch.ca and as well you can follow us like I said on any of our social media uh, platforms. So church, let us enter into a time of worship.
count on one thing The same God that never fails Will not fail me now You won't fail me now In the waiting The same God who's never late Is working all things out You're working all things out Yes, I
For the song was ruled for good For the lamb had conquered death Then the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who come To the Father are restored And the church of Christ was Good morning, church. Good morning, family. I'm excited to join you this morning, and thank you for tuning in as we dig a little deeper into our series on the seriousness of our sin. It's not the the most fun topic I get to preach on. It's probably not the most fun topic you get to sit and listen to. But understanding the seriousness of our sin in view of the holiness of God gives us such an incredibly redemptive and restorative perspective. And my hope is that you will leave today, you will leave more in awe of God. You will leave more aware of who we are in Christ and like me, be reminded of the goodness of God even in light of our sin. This morning and and next week, I wanna take us through a well-known story of a minor prophet named Jonah. Um, So have your Bibles open and crack them open or, or open your app to Jonah and we're gonna land this week and next week on a very short story but an incredible story of a grouchy, obstinate, disobedient, angry prophet of God. And and as we pull this book apart, we get to look at his sin and his actions, and we get to see how God's incredible response to him also reflects back on our lives as we consider the weight and the seriousness of our own sin. Let's pray this morning as we open up God's word. God, thank you for your word. Thank you that, that you have brought us your living, active, breathing word that we have access to, that we can read, that we can understand. God, as we go through it, we get to see your character. We get to see who you are. We get to understand you more so that when we're we're living in our life, we can see its truth reflected. We understand who you are and how you're moving. God, I pray this morning as we look at the behaviors, the actions, the disobedience of of a character named Jonah, that that we can bridge that gap, that we can understand that, that you wanna speak to us through this that you want to connect with us this morning about the weight and the seriousness of, this, of our sin in our lives. Amen. Growing up in our home, in the Burnham household, as you would walk through our front door, there was, there was a little hallway and then there was an archway that led into the kitchen and over top was a sign that said, as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. That was my parents' heart. That was, that was their faith and that was their hope for our household. And years ago, as as Megan and I started to develop our own family and and get our own house, we we thought about a sign that we could put at our entranceway, what what reflected our our heart. Um, And and we had uh, had made for us a sign, that it's a quote from one of my favorite um, preachers, which is Charles Spurgeon, and it says, I've learned to kiss the waves that throw me up against the rock of ages. So I was walking through the text of Jonah, and I was just thinking, what is the text that as I walk through, what, what quote or what idea or what, what would come to mind when we read Jonah that, it, that, that would reflect something I'd want to put in the entranceway of my house? So if, if you open the door, what from Jonah screams at me that I want to share it with people? 
I landed, I landed on a, just a sign, and I, you know, I'm going to picture it in a nice rustic frame and calligraphy, uh, calligraphy scrawled on it, and it just says, the love of God is like the morning breath of a whale. Now, maybe, not, that's, maybe that's not the most welcoming phrase, but I think as we see through this text, we're going to see what a sweet reminder that is of God's love and God's grace and God's mercy. Now, Jonah is a bit of a different book. Normally, when, when it comes to minor prophets, we get, a, we, get a speak, we get to see them speak to God's chosen people. We get, a, we get to see a man chosen by God to speak on behalf of God, and we get to hear their warnings of coming judgment, of hope, of promise uh, to kings and to nations. And, and the focus of the minor prophets, we get to just see God moving and God's word spoken through a prophet to a nation or to some specific group of people. Jonah is a little bit different. While we do get to see that, the focus of Jonah is going to be more on the minor prophet himself. We get to see his, his actions. We get to see his disobedience. We get to see more uh, of his heart exposed. And even better, we get to see how God interacts with him, with his sinful heart and with his actions. Let's read with me. Open to the first chapter, to the first verse. Let's start with there. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, go. Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare, and he went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Only a few verses in, and we can clearly see some very glaring, giant issues with Jonah's character. Jonah was a well-known prophet at this time. He had spoken to kings. He had spoken to nations on God's behalf. And he hears God's word. He knows God's voice. And here he not only decides just to ignore that calling, but according to verse 3, he says he wants to flee from the presence of the Lord. You know, in some sense, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a great book to read because we have the ability, if, if you're a Christian and you grow up in the church and you know this, or we have ability to kind of separate ourselves from this great prophet and keep a little bit of distance between us because we know his actions and we kind of know the crazy story that's about to follow. There is this wild storm. There is a ship that he is on that's about ready to break in two. There's, there's fishermen and mariners crying out to their false gods, throwing off their, their, their luggage and throwing off all, all their stuff. And then they're, they're praying and they're casting lots to see who's responsible. And then we see Jonah say, I'm responsible. The lots point to him and then, and then he gets hurled overboard. And then that big epic part where a giant fish comes and swallows him up. I think all that gives us the ability to kind of recline and, and read the story and shake our head about the seriousness of Jonah's sin and how it gets him into a world of trouble. Because Jonah, unlike any of us here, I'm sure, actually outright disobeys God. I mean, we can easily separate ourselves from this, this Jonah character because he has direct access to God's voice and to his word. I mean, he was actually told what to do and what to say. And in verse two, it says, arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it. That's incredible. That's his job. He is a prophet. He, he speaks for God to bring a message to people that was given to him by God's voice. I mean, how terrible that, that he would ignore these instructions. I suppose one a counter to that would be that, that we actually have God's living, breathing word here in our hands, a word of truth that gives us purpose, that instructs us how to live and how to love and, and how to walk in our faith and gives us very clear directions and calling. But, but, but I agree, that let's, let's keep the separation here a little bit. I mean, Jonah was actually a prophet. Like he was chosen by God to speak his words, to proclaim the truth to the world. God was actually with him. God walked with him. He heard God's voice. God instructed him. That's, that's got to be a little bit different than us. Again, I, I suppose a fair counter to that could even be found in Matthew 28, 19, where, where the Great Commission does call us to go, therefore, into the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you 
until the end of the age. I'm sure at this point, someone out there is still hanging on to one part that, yeah, yeah, but there was a big fish. Well, that may be coming. In the first few short verses, we hopefully can by now close the gap between this prophet from 2,700 years ago and see ourselves in this story. The story of Jonah has the gospel written all over its pages. What I love about this book is so deeply relatable to me, to my story. And, and Matt mentioned last week that if we can't approach this topic with humility, then we're going to miss the message. The story of Jonah is a story of your sin. It's a story of my sin. It's our story of living in disobedience. The story of Jonah shows us a concrete example of sin and grace. 700 years before Christ, we are seeing the story of the gospel play out. In verse 3, you'll notice that it says he went down to Joppa and found a ship here. And I can't say for certain, but I'm, I'm going to take a little risk here and say I don't believe it was very hard to find. In fact, the reason I can say that is because I can speak from personal experience that when I, when I want to live actively against God's word, when I want to flee God, when I want to flee his call in my life, whatever I want to do at that point, it's not going to be hard to find. That ship is going to be ready and, and, and available for me to get to sail on. I can tell you, church, that, that whenever you want it, your ship to Tarshish will be there waiting. If you, if you want to escape from the presence of the Lord, if you want to escape from God's call in your life, if you want to escape from the great commission and how God requires us to live, then 24 hours a day, I promise you, that ship will be waiting for you to flee. Let me just give you one modern day example. I think we could see our phones as that ship to Tarshish. I mean, we don't even need to walk down to Joppa. Uh, we can just escape into disobedience right at the press of our fingertips. Exploding uh, unchristlike debates on social media. Sinful and perverse Google searches made quick and easy and private. The easily justified addictions to, to spending or, or late night ordering or gambling made easy online. Or, or what about the, the gossip and slander network with friends that goes all day? What about the love of money that has you gripped so tightly to notifications as, as a stock market fluctuates, it pulls you out of his word? Or what about the endless prideful, boastful, lustful, sexual posts of, of twisted truth filling our lives with likes and hearts? And I could go on. This is just one thing. This is just the phone. We have specific instructions from God. We have words of truth to deliver. We have a directive to feed the hungry and clothe the poor to speak light into the darkness, to go into all the world and make disciples. But listen, because I'm not excluded, all of us at a time have found the convenience of getting on our ship so we can steer clear of God's word and get away from the presence of the Lord. Church, I promise you, your ship to Tarshish will always be accessible. A quote I once read said one of the most profound things that you can know about yourself is how you specifically and uniquely run away from the Lord. What do you do when you run? Where do you go when you run? Are you aware of how you run and to whom do you run? My friends, family, church, burn the ship. Set it on fire and, and walk back towards God's calling in your life. Just burn the ship. There's a small detail in the third verse that as I read over and over again, I find myself thinking of the beauty of the God's specific intentionality in his word. Let me just read it again for you. It says, but Jonah rose to flee from, to, to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and he went down to Joppa. He found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare and went down into it. So he paid the fare. I find this detail very interesting. As I read it over and over, it becomes a stark reminder for me that there is a cost to pay when I want to board the ship to sin. 
On one hand, we as professing Christians hold tightly to this sweet truth that the wages of sin is death, the cost of our sin is death, but the gift of God is everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We, we accept and we understand that, that Christ has paid the ultimate cost. That for our sin, he paid the cost on the cross and in his death, uh, he paid dearly for us. And in his resurrection, death lost its sting, death lost its victory, yet, yet in our selfishness, in our pride, in my wickedness, we choose to live openly and sometimes we think we choose to live privately and as, as a result, we pay dearly for those sins. For those who follow Christ, we can't simply look at the consequences of Jonah's sin and disobedience from a distance anymore. We need a reminder to consider the weight and the seriousness of the sin in our lives. We need to look inwardly and be reminded of the cost that we are choosing to pay. You see, when Jonah decided to flee, he made his own decision that had vast consequences for those who were left in a sinful wake. The fishermen who, who would cry out for God's mercy suffer the consequences and, and possibly the hundreds of thousands, if Jonah got his way, the hundreds of thousands of Ninevites wouldn't have gotten the word of warning if Jonah continued to live in his own sin. And we often feel that in the privacy of a moment, maybe at night on our phones or, or when we're in a vehicle or a car or wherever we are, we feel like in the privacy of that moment that the sin doesn't really affect anyone else. Friends, how often have we seen our sin being poured out over, over our marriages, over our children, over our households, over our families, over our extended families, over our Bible studies, over our small groups, over our church? There is such a cost to pay by those often that we love the most when we choose to live in perpetual sin. We can't often see it. We, we often don't want to. We, we so often refuse to consider the seriousness of our own sin because of our deep, deep pride for fleeting pleasure, for temporary gain, for personal desires, for, for just preferences, for fear and anxiety, bitterness, greed and hate, whatever it is, we pay a cost to get on that ship to sail away. So Jonah gets on the boat and it doesn't take long before we get to see some of those characteristics of God that maybe we don't normally hang on the entranceway of our houses. As we continue in a story, we're going to see the sweetness of the corrective love of God. Let's read from verse 4. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they, they hurled cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner parts of the ship and laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise and call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give us a thought that we may not perish. So is this a picture or an image of God here displaying his incredible and his, his amazing wrath? his power and his fury towards Jonah and his disobedient heart, we can easily look at this picture and see a powerful scene of God's justice and God's wrath being poured out onto a disobedient, sinful, obstinate failure of a prophet. Seeing it through that lens is to miss the true beauty of this story and it's, it's to miss the true nature of the loving character of God. You see, in this story, and in my story, and in your story, God's wrath would have been silence. God's wrath would have been still waters and a modest wind that, that let them ship uh, the sail in their ship well across the sea, quietly. God's wrath would have been allowing Jonah to free, to flee from his presence. It's not though God's, God's sweet, corrective love and God's goodness and his mercy and his grace is that storm. It brings the storm to stop and correct Jonah. To stop you. To stop me and to correct me. 
Look at Hebrews 12, 6. It reminds us, it says, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. Don't be wary when reproved by him for the Lord disciplines the ones he loves. And he chastises every son whom he receives. The perfect love of God uses correction to guide us into the direction we need. It's out of his love that at times, at times he gently and at times with billowing waves and crashing waves threatens to break the hull to remind us of who he is and how much he loves us and how much our sin will cost us if we don't repent and turn from our wicked ways. Let's continue here in verse 10. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is this that you have done? For, for the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then he said to them, what, sh what shall we do to you so that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. And he said, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it's because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode harder to get back to dry land, but they could not. For the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood for you, O Lord, have done as you please. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. They offered sacrifices to the Lord and made vows. That is such a sweet part to this story that as Jonah confesses his sins, as he attributes the storm to the response of the powerful living God in his life due to his disobedience, this bolt full of pagan unbelievers that because of their sin were hell bound, they get to see and witness and are awestruck by the powerful corrective love of God. A God that for his glory won't let Jonah's disobedience go uncorrected. A God that not only stops the direction of his servant attempting to flee his presence, but in his mercy turns the hearts of the men on the ship who call out to him, who sacrifice and make vows to him to give their hearts to him, to the living God of the universe. That is a God of mercy, of grace, of correction and love. We could almost end it here if it wasn't for the amount of notes I had left. I mean, the sea has calmed. Jonah has, has accepted that he has been disobedient and has openly confessed his sin. The sailors have, have recognized God for who he is, feared the Lord greatly, and have sacrificed and made vows to him alone. Even though we've, we've only scratched the surface of this book, what a sweet story. Except for the fact we have a prophet who's just been hurled overboard. Unfortunately for Jonah... It doesn't quite end there. You see, he didn't ask for a lifeboat. He didn't ask for an oar. We see earlier that they're, they're rowing back to shore as fast as they could. He didn't ask for those. And he actually didn't even call out to God and said, okay, stop the storm, turn me around, take me back to shore, I'll go. No, he didn't do any of that. Instead, he just asked for death. I'm not going. So if you want the storm to stop, throw me over. His heart has not changed. His disobedient ways have not, he recognizes God for who he is. He recognizes his sin, but he, his heart has not changed. Now we're gonna continue into the story and we get to see another sweet view of God through his disciplining love for his children. Verse 17 says that, that the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. And I don't know about how many of you are parents. I'm a parent, I have four kids, um, and I'll suggest that maybe similar to your household, on more than one occasion, I've had to send my kids to their room if, if they're being disobedient, making poor choices, being mouthy, whatever it is, I have to send them to their room, a, kind of a, a time by themselves, removed from their friends, removed from their, removed from their TV or their books or their toys. And my hope is to see a heart change. My hope is that they'll have a moment in their room where they'll contemplate how they acted, what they did, and have a repentant heart and come out and say, sorry, let's start again. Now, I've never had to go so far as, as wanting to put them in the room for three days and three nights, but I can't say I haven't been tempted. But for Jonah, for three days and three nights, Jonah is in the belly of a great fish where he's given time to consider his actions, his heart, and the consequences of his disobedience. 
For most of us, being in the belly of a whale isn't a very sweet picture, and it's, it's certainly not the sweetness that we think of when we consider love. Yet the belly of a physical giant fish is what God used to grind down Jonah. It's the fire he used to, re, to refine him into, be, in, into obedience. And, and when Jonah is at his lowest, when he is most exposed, that's when we see a repentant heart. That's when we see a change in heart posture before the king. I've always had this vision. Uh, I can't say it's everybody's vision, but when, when Jonah says, throw me overboard and the seas are raging and they finally do throw him overboard, that, that maybe the, the sea started to calm and there are some waves and Jonah started to swim against it, and then this massive fish comes up and swallows him. And maybe, maybe the sailors sat there and they saw it as the boat's still slightly rocking, they're watching it, and they're in awe of this. But, but I'm corrected as I read chapter two of Jonah. I'm corrected in that, and let's just read it together because there's a very different picture of God's response here to Jonah. Read with me chapter two. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, out of the belly of the fish, saying this. I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of shale, I, I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounds me. All your waves and your billows pass over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall look again upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The, the deep surrounded me. The weeds were wrapped around my head. And, and at the roots of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, then I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah up on dry land. What we see here in chapter two in that prayer of Jonah is we see a clear period of suffering. We don't see an instant rescue. We also haven't seen as Jonah gets tossed overboard, we haven't seen a change of his heart. We see him recognize his sin and recognize God from the storm, but his response is not to turn back to God. It's just to be killed. We don't see a change in his heart. And Jonah is struggling. And as he slips down into the sea, he's in a clear, clear period of suffering through the weight of his sin. Look at those words. The water closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. The weeds were wrapped about my head. The roots of the mountains, I went down to land whose bars closed up on me forever. It's amazing. In this, in this moment, you can see Jonah finally having this heart shift. During a period of, of suffering, he says, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you. Awake, O oh sleeper, and pray to your God. Jonah was drowning, the waves and billows overtaking him. And in his time of suffering, in, in this period of, of waiting on the Lord for rescue, he offers prayers and thanksgiving. My question for you is, are you in that waiting period of suffering? Do you feel like you are drowning in your own sin? Do you feel like, like you are at the roots of the mountain so weighed down by poor decisions, by, by ego, by pride, by addictions that, that God can't or God won't restore you? And can you feel the disciplining love of God in your life right now? How long do you think that it felt for Jonah as he sank into the deep? How desperate did he feel? How alone did he feel? How far from hope did he feel? Verse seven, he says, when, he, when my life was fainting away, then I remembered the Lord and came to you. To the point of drowning, to the point of the end of his life, the final moments, he remembers the goodness of God. He offers thanksgiving and he says, salvation belongs to the Lord. That actually reminds me of the words of the captain when, when he runs down into the hall and finds him sleeping. He says, what do you mean, O sleeper? 
Wake up and call to your God. It took Jonah to the point of drowning, to the point of death, to wake up and call out to his God. We see Paul in the church, to, uh, we see Paul calling the church in Ephesians 5.14. He says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. How many of us are sleeping our way through faith? How many are, are living in sin and, and porn, greed, pride, lust, fear of man, lying, cheating, stealing, turning our backs from God, actively fleeing from the presence of the Lord, lost in slumber, ignoring his call in our life? The boat is breaking apart. The family is in turmoil. Your, your marriage is broken. Your, your finances are beyond repair. Substance abuse has gripped you and devastated you. The storm is so out of control that you just run and hide or you just say, throw me off the boat. Church, friends, family, your sin is serious. Our sin is serious. And we are paying a cost to ride. I wonder if you are just getting on your boat, elated to, to, to choose to do this, to get into sin, or, or if your ship is already breaking apart. Well, what do you mean, sleeper? Wake up and call to your God. Remember the Lord today. Remember that it's because of his love that he corrects us. It's because of his love that he disciplines us. But guys, watch, here it comes. It's because of his love that he restores us. We go through correction. We, we take the discipline because we know out of his love that he will restore us. It's so often in that storm that we are reminded of who God is and who we are not. And I want to end here at the beginning. I, I want to end here showing you such a sweet picture of the gospel here. I want to end on the restoring love of God. There's hope in this story. There's so much hope in this story, a, a reminder of hope for you and your story wherever you're at. Put your finger on, on chapter one, verse one. I'm going to read chapter one. Put your finger there with me. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. Now drag your finger with me to chapter three, flip a page, or just go to chapter three. Let's look at the very first verse. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Arise, and go to Nineveh, the great city, and call it against it, the message that I'll tell you. Did you see that? That God hasn't changed, that his message hasn't changed, that, that his heart for his people hasn't changed, that his call to Jonah in his life hasn't changed, that his call and commission in your life hasn't changed, that just Jonah's disobedience only caused him turmoil. Jonah's disobedience caused him turmoil, but God hasn't lingered on your past. God hasn't held on to what Jonah did. He didn't remind him of what he did. Everything after chapter one, verse one, all that sin and disobedience, all of it led to violent storms, near death drowning, swallowing of a great fish, time in isolation. It's forgotten, it's done, it's erased. That, that's the gospel. Those sins are paid for. Jesus on the cross has paid for your sins so you don't have to. And that's the redemption story that we are called to go into all the world and preach to the nations. 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. This isn't a story about a whale at all. It's not a story about Jonah's disobedience. It's not even a story about God's wrath. This is the gospel story. That's 700 years before Christ, we see the gospel playing out. Our sins separating us from God's presence and, and, and Christ comes to take the weight and the guilt of our sin. He dies sinlessly with a, with a stain of our disobedience, buried for three days and rising again after three nights to defeat death, to conquer the wages of our sin so we can find full restoration with God. God in his correcting love 
God in his disciplining love and God in his restorative love, in his grace and because of the forgiveness we have from the cross simply moves forward. It's amazing that correlation, how Jonah in his sin remains in the fish for three days and three nights, recognizing his sin. He calls out to the Lord and he says, salvation belongs to the Lord. After that, he is, he is spit up on dry land, corrected, disciplined, and restored. God's mercies are new every morning for you. So sleeper, if you are living in sin, if you are paying the cost of your sin, if you're feeling the weight and the burden and the defeat of your sin, wake up, sleeper, and call to your God. Turn from your sin and repent. Where are you at right now? Are you willingly getting on the ship of disobedience? An attempt to flee God's call in your life, are you already well onto your journey? Are you, are you asleep in the bottom of the boat while it's about to break? Or are you sinking to the roots of the mountains in a period of suffering, overwhelmed by the consequences of your sin, experiencing the corrective love of God in your life? Or are you in the belly of a whale under his loving discipline, being ground down and refined, praying thankfulness? Salvation belongs to the Lord. Church, what is your ship to Tarshish? Will you have the courage to burn your ships today? Will you repent? Will you turn away from your sin? Will you run toward God's calling in your life to obedience? Sleep or wake up and call to your God. He is a God of grace. He is a God of mercy. He is a God of correction, a God of discipline, a God of restoration because he is love. Burn your ships and turn towards God's call to repentance and holiness. Let him restore you fully and completely. Let's pray. God, what a sweet reminder it is that there is a seriousness and a weight to sin when we choose to perpetually live in it. God, God, remind us of that. And God, if I have to go through a storm to be shaken, to be corrected, God, I accept that. God, thank you for this picture of your, of your corrective love, of your disciplining love, and God, your sweetness of your restoring love. Restore us today, God, as we, as we turn this off at home or if we leave, God, I pray that we just, we feel the burden of our sin and we take it to you, to the cross. God, help us to repent, help us to turn and go the other way. Amen.